Welcome back to the Coach Logic Podcast. I'm your host, Max Ada. Well, with my co-host, I guess, Josh Gibson. Josh, you just got back from sunny, beautiful Ohio. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, you know, you say that as though it's a step down, but when you live in Morgantown, West Virginia, it's a bit of a yeah. step up. So. <laughs> That's true. That's true. The, the only upgrade from Morgantown is, is Ohio. The only downgrade from Ohio is Morgantown. <laughs> uh, but I'm doing well. Yeah, the, the, yeah. It's, it's it's relatively nice out. It's kind of like spring weather. Um, the the expo itself was ran really well. No big complaints from me. I think I think they've kind of got it down to where each year feels very similar, and that there's not a lot of change um, for the worse. I'd say it's generally a really well ran meet, um, from the powerlifting side and from the weightlifting side, um, to where the competition runs well, plenty of equipment, plenty, plenty of, uh, platform space. Um, a lot of people coming out to watch weightlifting. So I think it was really well ran and, and a fun you're, competition. You're from Ohio, obviously. So have, how many times have you been to the Arnold? Do you think do you usually go every year or is it something you, you know, maybe you've only been to a few times? Well, I remember the first time I went was when it was a single stage and it was, mm, uh, back in the day. yeah, it was, so it was a competition and uh, the results were based on Sinclair. So it was more so like a big, big meet. And, that's uh, the, uh, when it was a Sinclair meet, that's the meet where Donnie Shankle claimed to be the only American to ever beat a, a current world champion. It, he neglected to mention that it was a Sinclair meet where he was a weight class heavier than Klokov and beat his total by one kilo. And so actually ended up in second place. But, you know, you take the wins where you can fabricate them, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think I think at that point, saying you you won the the Arnold, right? You 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 <laughs> you uh, took first, uh, you know, at the Arnold was a really, really big deal. I think now if you win AO, AO1, it's like yeah. you win an, a series meet, which isn't anything to, to scoff at necessarily. But I think like being an Arnold champion then is different from being an American Open Series one champion now. Yeah. Well, it used to be a local meet, right? So the Arnold was run as a local competition and it was almost always a, a money meet. There was always some yep. prize money. And then like you'd have the random one year, I remember, um, I remember there was a competition. It was like the Oceana versus USA plus a Pan Am qualifier. And um, Kendrick Ferris was competing. And uh, he, he did a squat jerk. And he like caught at the very bottom, like super deep. He was fighting to recover. And he was like grinding out the, the recovery overhead squat. And about halfway up, he just blacked out. Yeah. And he fell backwards, and the bar looked like it was good. I mean, it almost hit his knees. Like, it would have been brutal. It didn't uh, hit him at all. Yeah. He was laying there, and it was like silence for 10 seconds. Nothing. And everyone then, all of a sudden, one man in the audience, a brave soul, yells, is anyone going to help him? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. <laughs> Oop. Yeah, and then and then his coach was in the back, and he uh, bumped him by one kilo to get some rest, right? Yeah, I, it might have been a third attempt, but yeah, <laughs> no, no, yeah, I think he came out and made it or something. It was crazy Holy like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was it was one of those events, but it was like a local meet and the Pan Am qualifiers, all those kind of things. Obviously, now it's AO final, sorry, AO series, right? And it's kind of solidified as that, which has made it a much bigger event, way more people. How many people do you think were there this time? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, I think with registration, there's always over a thousand, um, probably 1100, 1200. I mean, I think they cap it around high nines, but they always just start let people in off the wait list. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, obviously you do remote coaching, you do regular coaching. Uh, you know, you had a whole thing there. Um, I guess if anyone's interested in getting coaching from you, a segue, you can check out teammate.com. You can go to Josh's Instagram um, and sign up for some remote coaching. You can go to Philosophical Weightlifting as well, get some coaching there. But outside of you doing coaching, how many people did you have? What sports were you coaching? And then maybe give a quick rundown of how it went. Yeah, so I had, I had three people specific 
specifically that I was coaching one on one. And then there were two people from the app. So weightlifting.ai. Oh, cool. Um, who showed up and, and they, they kind of reached out on the discord where we post and have kind of a running log of, Hey, here are meets. If you need a competition coach, you can put your name down. We'll, I, we'll find someone I'll generally handle you if I'm at the meet. Um, so we had Justin Negret and then Molly Canton. Um, they both nice. have been on the weightlifting AI for a long time and done super well on it. And then I coached Danny Myers, Glenn, who competed in the raw challenge for the USAPL. So that's powerlifting. Um, so I'd say overall is probably around like seven, eight. Uh, and then I handled L, um, oh, yep. you coach who's at UCLA currently. Uh, she's been getting programming from you for a while. And I yep. honestly watching her warm up, uh, not to get off, off track, but watching her warm up, her movement looks great. And she oh, doesn't nice. have an in-person coach. Like that's she's cool. just, just yeah. doing the program that you write and she looks better. And, and she's obviously like hitting PRs every single time she steps on a competition platform. Uh, so something's working. Well, it must be me. It must be all, me. <laughs> it's all the programming. Yeah. Um, that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. How did, uh, how did Danny do? Uh, she did really well. So she moved from the 100 plus class, the super heavy class down to the 100 kilo class. I think at nationals, um, I think it was 2022. I think that was around the time she was her kind of heaviest body weight. And she was around like 112, 113. And um, over the next like few years, she kind of dropped dropped weight um, for various reasons down to around 107, 106. And then we made a kind of distinct uh, purposeful push to get her into the 100 kilo class. So she dropped another like almost nine kilos in, oh, wow. in kind of the lead up to yeah the arnold uh, which it was you know a lot of people talk about how hard it is to gain or lose weight i mean if you just have a basic grasp of nutrition it's pretty simple um she dropped that weight and all she really did was track her food intake and we just kind of made adjustments based on the scale and it was consistent it really reliable and, and, and really easy for her. So she weighed in at 97 kilos and, um, broke the, broke the state record squat on her first attempt, broke the state record bench press on her third attempt, uh, and then broke her, broke the total state record. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because the person who holds those is Heidi Lewis. And she's like, uh, she was an incredible collegiate lifter, really, really strong, pulled 250 at like, yeah, pretty light, super heavy body weight. Um, so that was a lot of fun. She did really well, went eight for nine, um, set herself up to have a good regionals and a good nationals this year, where I nice. think if she does really, really well, she could win nationals. So nice. that's kind of, that's kind of the trajectory have trajectory we have. And honestly was the reason for this conversation with you and I is watching her perform as a coach. You're thinking like, okay, what, what are the major problems? Like, what are the lim limiters? Why is she not making more weight or bigger weights or bigger attempts? And then like, how does she respond to the training we've been doing? So what are the problems that seem consistent or solidified? And then what are the things that have worked well? So when you taper and peak someone, how do the weights move, right? Are, are the, mm -hmm. the weights that were moving slower in training, moving fast enough to where there was a significant effect of the taper? Um, does she look like she holds positions better when she's not as fatigued? Are those same problems we see in training, the same problems we see in competition. So you start to kind of run that and, and you, you kind of figure out, okay, after we debrief, what are the things we're focused on changing or focused on improving? And then how do we go about actually doing that when we have a system in place that didn't necessarily develop the problems, but didn't remediate them, right? Because if it, if it was a, a airtight system, there'd be no technical issues, or we would have been able to have tackled them effectively in training or we could readjust the system to then focus on things that are uh, new problems. So uh, yeah. that's what I wanted to talk to you about is like yeah. post competition, how do we decide what we're doing next to reach the next level of winning a nationals or hitting bigger totals um, on the competition platform? Yeah, it's an, that's an interesting question. It's an interesting topic too, because a lot of times we think of I think there's probably a few different schools of thought as far as the approach to training goes. And 
and it probably stems from people's perception of how progress happens. So the, the one school of thought is um, after competition, it's time to change things and do them differently because change is the thing that drives progress, right? And that could be at multiple levels. You could conceive of it as change in the overall program. So we do a new program or a new style of program or we were doing this block periodization, now we're doing DUP. Um, or, you know, we were doing, you know, four days a week of snatch and clean and jerk, now we're doing, you know, three or six, where it's like a wholesale change of your entire pr approach. And then it also trickles down to the other levels, which is like, okay, we need to do different exercises than we did before because adaptive resistance, or we need to do different uh, set and rep schemes because, you know, this like, we need to shock the system in some way. And then it goes down even further to the more minute level, which is like, oh, um, your technique was wrong or you, you could be better if we made some changes. Like now's the time to, now's the time to throw in that new grip thing with the snatch or, you know, now's the time to change to sumo deadlift or whatever it is. And so fundamentally the problem is, is more so that like, well, change is not the thing that drives results. Mm. We see this on a, a shorter time frame where it's like novel experience creates a, um, a you know, a, a robust response immediately. So it's like a new exercise injected into the program suddenly creates a more motivation or it's more exciting or there's a better result, right? Or, oh, we didn't do block snatches before, now we're doing them and, oh shit, we just made a PR. It's like, well, if you've never done them before, or you haven't done them for six months or a year, yeah, you're going to get that result or that novel experience is going to drive some, some, you know, you don't want to use the word novel again, but it's going to drive some sort of short term gain. Right. Um, so I think of it as that there's that school of thought, which is that change is the thing that drives progress versus, um, you know, stimulus is the thing that is going to stimulus overload and specificity are the thing that are driving progress. So when we finish a meet, the post meet wrap up, sort of summarization analysis of the program, what did we do that worked? What did we do that didn't work? Is, in my opinion, a more important place to come from than than the idea that like, okay, new new training cycle means new things. It could be that everything like you said, everything was airtight, it was perfect. There'd be no reason to change anything. Mm. You just maybe adjust the intensity or you make some adjustment for new maxes or whatever it is, and then you continue back on course. You might have a, a rest period, you know, like a recovery kind of period to get some, you know, just relief from all the hard training you've done and sort of build back into it. But, you know, the in general, we're not probably, we shouldn't be looking at new programming as the thing that's going to drive progress mm. as much as refinement of the current system. So I would say that's the first lens a, a young coach or a new coach should look at how they approach training after a meet is how do I refine what I did? Let's look at where we went right. Let's look at where we went wrong. You know, what, what appeared in the programming or what was not remediated as far as technique goes in the last block? How do we find a solution to that in the next block? And then change is the thing that, that is a result of that. It's emergent from the idea that we have to make some adjustments because what we did didn't work right. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And a, a lot of this really, too, is establishing, like, you have to have some sort of directionality with your process anyways to where you can't be wrong all the time. Yeah. Uh, you're not going to get worse into a meet or you're hoping not to get worse into a meet. So there has to be something that's going well enough that, Techniques improving, consistency is improving, absolute load is improving. There are uh, signposts that tell you, okay, we've got something dialed in. Um, and for me, it's saying, okay, what is a consistent issue in the system, or what's a consistent bug, right? So um, imagine that you know your car always tends to leak coolant. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, I can refill it and I can always drive, but it's always going to leak coolant. So you're not really solving the problem by refilling it all the time. Um, you're just kind of de delaying the inevitable that there's going to be a faster rate of emptying um, than if you were to fix the problem. 
So when you go to competition, you go to competition, it's like, yeah, you still swing the bar out, but you made bigger weights, but you still swing the bar out. So like the system's not doing its job necessarily, mm -hmm. because if the system did its, uh, did a perfect job, you would have Vardanian's technique, basically, if you subscribe to that, uh, that model. So you would look really sharp. Everything would kind of, um, everything would, um, converge on this point of technical efficiency and technical profession perfection. And you'd be getting closer and closer to that. But every time you go to competition, you have this kind of glaring problem. Um, so it's how do you take the system to manage the problem that's not going to go away just by training, not yeah. just by, yeah. you know, training hard or doing more reps <clears throat> or getting different cues. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, with with that in mind, with we understand that, OK, the, the system is in need of refinement. The thing we need to do as far as every every I like to look at training from a principle based approach, which is to say each principle in order of the magnitude of importance is answerable as an equation. So we have specificity on one side. The other side of that equation is, you know, the exercises, the intensities, the things we need to do to satisfy, you know, equaling what specificity is or achieving the, the degree of that principle that we need to manifest in the program. So I would go through each stage, each principle and look at, okay, how do we make a decision that better addresses the thing we're lacking? So before we can start any of this, the first thing we do is, you know, I think you'd call it like a needs analysis. After the meet's over, what happened, you know, okay, we had nine lifts or we had six lifts or whatever it is. We would then look at where did things fall apart? What technical errors, uh, you know, were consistent throughout the training cycle that never got remediated? And then once we establish a sort of like, you know, priority list of things that are most critical to work on, we then look at that list and break it down into how do we best address that? So for, let's say, specificity, let's just say exercise selection. You've got, you know, a snatch where you're swinging the bar out or you're jumping forward really bad. Okay, well, you know, where does the problem start? You know, what, what is the initial place that this thing starts? What is the kind of cause of this issue? And then what are the best sort of pool of exercises to address this issue? And then we would say, are we doing any of these? Whatever mm -hmm. we're doing currently, eliminate those because they clearly haven't fixed the problem. Or if, we're, if our execution isn't good, then we maybe would look at the execution. It might be that, you know, you have the right movements, but the athlete's doing them poorly, so you need to, you know, modify your coaching style or your teaching method. But let's assume that things are being done properly. If you're doing exercises that theoretically should fix the issue but are not, then you would remove them from that list and go down to the next most likely thing and incorporate that into the program now. And then you would do this basically for all movements that we want to make corrections to. Anything that we find biggest problem. Jumping forward, okay, you know, top movements would be something like a no foot snatch or, you know, uh, you know maybe pause snatch or something that might uh, directly address that. Once we say, okay, we've got this list, if it doesn't match anything we've been doing, we just start with that new list and we start incorporating it. Mm. If it does match, we remove the duplicates and then we start working with the things we haven't done because likely the things we've been doing that have not fixed it are going to continue to not fix it, right? Um, wishing and hoping harder doesn't make anything, anything happen. So that would be from an exercise selection process to say, okay, we, we refine our, our selection of, mo of exercises based on what is working, what's not working, what we think is most likely to. It also gives us a methodology to establish a, a sort of ranking of these exercises. So let's say in the bench press, for example, you've got, you know, Danny, she's benching and, you know, she sticks like wherever, like really high up. Um, and, you know, you start throwing in a bunch of close grip bench presses and all this like board presses and tricep work and it doesn't change the problem. Mm. It doesn't fix it. So the, we can mark down, we've got a list of, let's say, you know, 10 bench movements that we think are valuable to her. 
and you know we had close grip bench and five board press on there and then you're like oh well shit five board press is the dumbest exercise ever invented i'm going to move that down the list to the bottom because that didn't help her and it doesn't look like it's doing much of what we wanted to close grip bench that was in the program the entire training cycle and she still struggled struggled you know at the same position and didn't make any progress let's move that down the list because it doesn't seem like it's doing the job so that just kind of recycles this list Eventually, you're going to find this process will eliminate, sort of like separates the wheat from the chaff. It's the movements that are going to transfer, and you know they're transferring because when they're in the program, you know, all things being equal, the, the, the athlete makes progress on the technical element you want or on, you know, the overall uh, result. So it could be that you have a movement in, you know, like a, like, um, you know, for example, like a safety bar squat. Mm. where largely it's very similar loading. It's very similar, you know, it's like you could get really strong doing safety bar squats. But when that exercise is incorporated into the program, it may have a beneficial effect on somebody's rounding over in the squat or tipping forward. When you remove it, they might still get stronger, but they have the same technical mm. mistake. They might tip over still. When you have safety bar squats incorporated as well, they improve, right? Their technique improves. Another example of this to make it even easier is like something like a pause squat or a pause bench press may not like drive overall progress, but having like a long pause bench press might actually make them capable of making a bench in competition, right? Mm. Like it, it in and of itself is not driving, like it's not the hard driver of results, but it is the thing that's that solidifies the execution of the movement to the point that it is satisfying right. the, the rules of the sport. And so there's some subtle things like that. You know, jerks is a good example in weightlifting. If you press out jerks a lot in training, you could lift bigger weights, but you're not going to make them in competition. Whereas like, you know, some jerk drills or some, you know, supports or presses or whatever it is, isn't the direct influence on moving your jerk result up, but it cleans up the technique to a way that it is now satisfying the results of the sport. So that's how I would look at like something like exercise selection, right? We always want to have a priority list of things we're doing and we want to reorganize that as we learn new things. It might be that close grip bench presses are not the thing that drives, you know, the lockout strength for somebody. Um, it might be that they need to have a higher velocity off their chest. And so, you know, increasing the, the volume of heavy flies or increasing, you know, maybe an incline press for the upper pec, whatever it is. Like, it might be something slightly adjacent to what we think, so we need to keep that list in mind. If we, if we just have this thinking that is one plus one equals two, mm. close grip bench presses do this, that may not be true for everybody, right? Um, so I, I think that's the, the way to look at it. Yeah, and I think, too, with movements that don't directly target muscular muscles or different phases of the movement, you can make technical changes with the competition yeah. lift, right? So it's like, okay, um, you know, with the bench press, you're relatively flat backed. Um, if we can get a better arch or get, get a better yeah. position, touch point, bar path, we'll get a better bench. We don't need to run to a special exercise to, to try to correct that necessarily. It's like, you just have to do the, you know, you have to do the bench better, but it's like, you have to implement the technical changes. Yeah. So it's like, you have to work on, um, getting set better on the bench. You have to work on trying to pull your chest up and face the wall behind you a bit better. You have to focus on changing the touch point and then making that more consistent over time. And uh, with Emily, actually, so I, I, I've been coaching her for a, for a while now, and she snatched 77 kilos three times. The first two times, pretty egregious press outs. And then at the Arnold, she smoked it and it looked great. And a lot of that was like the technical changes we're trying to make just happen gradually. They're, they're, they get closer and closer and closer to what we want. And we just need more and more work with the very focused changes. Um, and, and kind of to your point too, about, you know, using specific exercises to fix problems. It's like, well, if you do the variation incorrectly, it doesn't yeah. do anything special, right? It just actually decreases the weight on the bar. That's really the only difference. Cause I've seen people do no hook, no feet snatches and still swing the bar away. It's like, so that doesn't have the intended effect yeah. that it's trying to have unless you execute it well. Um, so 
you can get closer and closer with the competitive lifts and, and good coaching and just like deliberate pr practice over time. Or you could start to, to transition to exercise that drive specific aspects of the movement or develop certain aspects of the body. Um, and a good example of this is, is with Danny kind of mentioned getting like pitched forward in the squat. And it's like, okay, she, that happens quite often, a little too often. So it's like, I remember when her squat was the best, we did more pin work. And yeah. I think a lot of that is just for her. It just really forces the correct position. One, you have to find the pins, you have to settle, and then you have to be in a good position out of the bottom. So you can't really cheat it. Like with a mm -hmm. pause, you can cheat a pause. Yeah. Um, with tempo work, you can cheat that. But it's like with pins, if you're on, if you're settled and you're in the right position, you have to touch the same point every single time. And it really punishes you if you're out of position. It's really yeah. hard to save. So I think what when we were having a lot of success, we used those well. So for this like next 12 week block where we have just like a low, low stakes meet, it's like, let's revisit that. Let's add in a little bit extra. So I kind of mentioned to you just transitioning to low bar and with the bench press, maybe we increase the frequency of pin bench to twice a week instead of one time. It's like, let's see what that does over 12 weeks because we know how the volume, we know roughly the volumes of work she needs. Yeah. We know roughly the intensities and we know roughly like the timelines, but it's like, just getting the exercise that really reinforce the right movement and then punish the wrong movement and just hedge yeah. you on that. Yeah. And you know, it's like, like you just said that, that small part, like the, the overload and the, the sort of like the other, the other things like, like overload will somewhat stabilize because there's just going to be a, a magnitude of stress that a person tolerates and adapts to. Right. And and the rate at which they adapt to it, all of these things, I would say, are probably more stable from the perspective that you're probably not going to go block, you know, cycle to cycle, jumping 10, 15 percent in volume. Right. As somebody is developing, you might right? a young athlete who's building, they might increase, you know, two or three percent volume increases every cycle. And then over a year, that's a 10 percent increase in total volume. At some point, you know, like where Danny's at, like that's going to stabilize largely. Mm -hmm. There's just not going to be these periods where you're just cranking up the volume um, or, you know, even the intensity, right? Like those things are largely more stable, I would say, in the in the process of refinement than exercise selection or, you know, the way that you apply the training stress, right? So it could be that the load is adjusted, maybe you shift the intensity slightly higher, you incorporate more, you know, top sets or less top sets or more, you know, you know some modification, but it's really just like a, a morphing of the load into a different shape, if right. you will, rather than it is a wholesale growth or reduction in that. Um, so yeah, so 100%, that makes a ton of sense. I'd also say, you know, from like your perspective, where it's like you come off of that training cycle, you have a successful meet, you're in good shape. The, the thing I would do, and I'm curious to know what your, your answer to this would be is, I would say we don't want to necessarily stray really far from the training. We don't want to go to a like, oh, now it's time to take a month off, you know, the old school like 90s bodybuilder or 90s powerlifting, you know, or, you know, 1950s weightlifting <laughs> sort of like, you know, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, I, I didn't even go to the gym for a whole month. Um, we, we know that's not necessary. So I would say there's an initial period of time after the competition where I would have a few goals that I need to be satisfied before we start our next training cycle. Mm. Um, this is barring any major competitions that have a timeline. If we have a meet nine weeks away that's a 100% uh, must do, we just sort of, you know, we have to do it, right? But I would say that period after, definitely you must train but our goal is to do one thing is the first goal is to not get our athlete into a point where they start to lose motivation, mm. right? It's very easy to come off a training cycle that's either really bad or even more so actually really successful. And the athlete loses focus on what the long-term goal is. And so they, they, you basically get in a place where they have, you know, they, they're either satisfied or they're kind of like they did really well and they got home and there was no parade. And so it's like, oh, like I just did that and I kicked ass and I built myself up for this and like it doesn't seem like it really was worth it. 
Um, so, you know, finding a, the next training goal as a like sort of reintroducing training in a way that is in, you know, inspiring, fun, motivating. And then the secondary thing would be like, you know, resensitizing them a little bit to, to training hard again. So it might be that we take a week or two or three, depending on the time frame, that is, you know, more general in nature or very general in nature. And we've talked about this on podcasts before, but, but, you know, maybe even that like pre sort of like hypertrophy training where it's work capacity, you know, technical changes, introducing new movements, trying some things that are different, getting them excited about coming to the gym and feeling good. Then we can transition into, um, you know, into the next, the next training cycle. And then that would be like, you know, we started with general training. Uh, you know, we've, we've gone through that. You'd move into, you know, after you start your initial general phase, hypertrophy, whatever it is, work capacity, and then move into your normal training. You want to do that in a way where there's a lot of, in my opinion, there's a lot of enthusiasm right from the get go. If you're starting off and you're tired and they're not excited and they don't know why they're doing it, you're going to be tripping over yourself in a few weeks. And then you're going to be in this place where you're constantly having to try to make an adjustment just to get people to want to do it. Well, I think, I think alongside that, from a coaching standpoint, I try to keep the programming interesting because yeah. One, I'm trying to get closer to the best program possible or the best like structure of programming or the structure of creating programs, the best coaching possible, right? So I'm like trying to move toward that. What that doesn't look like is repeating the same thing over and over. It doesn't look like we have a model and we just reapply the model. What that yeah. does for me is it's uh, a, a meet, a, a competition in and of itself is hypothesis generating and I mean, it's hypothesis testing, but it's more so hypothesis generating in that like, you did a bunch of stuff, here are the results. What do we expect with certain, what do we need to change and what do we expect if we do change it? So you start to generate some ideas of, let's test this out, let's test this out, let's test this change in frequency or order of exercise or number of exercises or the exercise themselves timelines, all that stuff, right? All the variables we think about how we can move those around to create a different effect. And then we start to put it into practice. So what I did, uh, Danny competes, I, I watched the competition. I know already what I need to do as the competition's happening. I'm kind of gauging like what was successful, what wasn't. Um, what do we, what have we consistently done well? And then what can I kind of anchor that to, right? So it's like, okay, you take a third attempt and you blow it up. It's like, yeah, the taper tends to work reliably. And then that structure of how we set up training prior to the taper also worked because yeah. it ended with a, a bigger result than we would have anticipated. And then we look at kind of what didn't really change with a taper or with a peaking block. And we think about like, okay, how can we remediate that? Um, after the fact, you sit down, you look at what's been successful and what hasn't. And then you, you kind of hedge on, okay, what has been successful? Where are we at and how can we reintroduce a few of those concepts or ideas and change them enough to where they can accommodate the current uh, level of performance, right? So if you have someone who's a rank beginner and you give them some variation that might have a positive result. Now, if they're an intermediate or advanced liver, lifter, just adding in variation won't have the same effect, yeah. but it will have an effect. So it's yeah. like, let's reintroduce some, some concepts that got us results um, maybe in previous training blocks and in, in previous years, and then make some modifications to where they're at currently and what the timeline is. Uh, that's why I'd like to, to break, you know, we we'll say we have 25 weeks of training. Let's break that down a little bit so we can test some ideas and then see, you know, if they, if they happen to work, um, then we can reapply them kind of when the bigger competitions are, are coming up. Um, so this like next 12 weeks, you know, for, for Danny and then for other people that I also work with, it's more so testing some hypotheses that I came up with um, after the competition based on my experience coaching the person, but also talking to coaches who have some experience with certain problems, um, certain solutions and similar situations. And that's basically how I tend to um, approach using that information well. And I, and, and I don't know what your, your process generally is, but, uh, it's, it's kind of hypothesis generating hypothesis testing, and then refining for 
the big competition, the nationals, the international meet, whatever it is. I just copy paste <laughs> done. It's called remote. It's called remote coaching, Josh. It's a it's a little thing I do. Uh, <laughs> Sunday night, I I do two hundred. <laughs> I've got two hundred and sixty athletes. I write individual programming for. Uh, you know, um, no. Uh, what what I would say is, yeah, I agree one hundred percent. I think, I mean, you know, the reality is like this is the entire reason, uh, largely why we're building Coach Logic. You know, like why the why the mentorship exists, why the platform will right. exist. Like it's it's so that we don't sit there as coaches and have a Google sheet or you know some true coach or something and like. You, you spit out a program that's yeah. fucking awesome and they do great. And then what do you do? Do you just start writing from scratch? Do you copy the old program and apply it? Like, I want insights. I want to know what's driving progress. I want to know the metrics. I want to just be able to look at something and say, help me understand what was good, what was bad, so I can make better choices. Because eventually I want to get to a point where I can write a program for somebody doesn't matter if it's perfect day one, but by the end of the program, we've made all of the choices that are better every time, right? You know, it's trade-offs, right? We know there's no right answer, but we want to be able to make the better choice each time. So 100%, like, the process has to be, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the term, but, like, data-driven. It has to be something where we take the information, we can extract what's useful to us, and then apply it to the, to the next thing. And just like you said, right, it's like, Meets that are are unsuccessful or successful are largely hypothesis creating. It's like saying, "Why did we do so well here?" Right. You know, I, I'd almost I'd almost say in a lot of cases, and maybe coaches that are listening, the three of you out there, you know, do you almost find that successful meets are almost a bigger question mark than unsuccessful meets? Because unsuccessful meets, you know, whatever we did didn't work. Mm. successful meets can be like 10 different reasons why it doesn't work. Was it the programming? Did they just have a, you know, are they just a bad competitor? Is it, you know, X, Y, and Z? What did they do the night before? I have, I've had training cycles with athletes that were world record holders, great training cycles and go to the meet and they compete and they look like shit. And then you find out, well, they cut way more body weight than you knew they were cutting and ended up, you know, rehydrating and reconstituting in a really poor way with like, you know, coconut water or something versus like, you know, a, an electrolyte drink, like a Pedialyte. And so it's like, well, was the training cycle that bad? Do you, do you blame all of the performance on the person's weight cut? Like, what do you do? So, so I do think that there's, you know, there's a lot to be said for being able to extract, you know, develop a hypothesis around how the meet went, what, what happened in that training cycle, extract that information, extract the data that's useful, that's actionable, and then do something with it. So like that's where I, you know, that's where I'm trying to get, right? That's what we're trying to create is something like that, as well as the sounding board. You know, the mentorship program is obviously designed around us of creating a sounding board of coaches that can understand each other and talk about it so that you don't walk away from a situation where you're like, oh, you know, did close grip bench presses help or not? Right. You know, should I try something different? How do I know if they're helping? Um, so yeah, so that's yeah, that's I 100% agree with what you're saying. Like that's largely the the approach that you know um, I try to take. I think it, it's limited by tools at this point. You know, it's limited by the ability to actually apply that stuff. Yeah, and I think it's kind of funny because I I've been talking to Danny and and I, I actually asked you about a few ideas with with programming, um, and they were great re ideas. reintroducing some less specific exercises, conventional deadlifts to strengthen the back and to get away from sumo a little bit. And also, you know, when you haven't done something for a really long time that you could use as a, a competition lift, you might be really yeah. good at it. It might, it might actually exceed what you can do with the other variation. Uh, a good example of this, I, uh, one day I, I was in Max's gym actually, and I pulled 230 sumo. And I was like, I, I think I told you, I was like, I could pull 251. Yeah. And, and I only pulled, I pulled sumo like once in my life. And uh, I went in, Tom was taking photos, put 251 on the bar. Yeah, smoked it, flexed at you. Yep. Um, oh, you were flexing? Oh, I didn't, I couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> I, all I remember is I was, 
I was beat red, uh, probably from yeah. straining against the sumo pole for like ten it's seconds. All the trend. It's all the trend you took beforehand. <laughs> yeah, I actually got it. Yeah. Only it's the only way a human being can deadlift two hundred fifty kilos is to be, is to literally inject five cc's of trend into your neck every day for a week. <laughs> Otherwise, no one, no one's ever done it without that. It's just not possible. Right. right. The weight's too big. Yeah. So, and that's coming from someone who's pulled over 300 kilos. So, yeah. um, <laughs> it, and my point in saying that is, you know, we go back to the conventional deadlift, you know, just like you go back to say you're a power jerk or you go back to the split jerk, suddenly you hit a uh, competition PR. Yeah. It's like, okay, so that's good information. It's general training but we can use it in a way that can also inform future training. And I think yeah. that's the idea, right? Is you, you take, so what I'm doing is it's, Hey, let's do a program. <laughs> let's do something where we take the greatest hits. You know, it's a Mike Tushier quote. You take the greatest yeah. hits. What have, what's worked really well and what's tend to allow us to have the best technique, the best performance. Let's reintroduce it in a, a slightly varied way. And then, you know, one or two other changes. And then just see what happens. So that's one thing I really love about coaching and programming and why I'm super excited for the dashboard um, mm. and the coaching platform is because it will allow me to coach more effectively and efficiently and have fun coaching and not have yeah. to worry about formulas or, or, or sheets or formats. And I can just program and I can coach and I can do that in, in a way that's creative and fun and and allows me to do what I like doing and do it well. Um, and that's what I, you know, I was up at like 1 a.m. last night and I programmed for two hours writing Danny's program. Um, and it was fun, right? And I can't wait to do that for more people. Um, that's a, I, I want to just touch on that one point because to me that's something that I feel like is, is maybe what I'm really, like really trying to do is make coaching something that I really – it's not that I don't love coaching, but it's like there's definitely like any of the other fellow, you know, fellow people who are, you know, coaching enjoyers, you know, programming is like like sitting down and working on an athlete and like thinking about the program, building it out, you know, like there's something really enjoyable about that, pro about that process when you feel like you're doing good work. Mm. Right. And, and doing good work is a, is a you know, concept you kind of brought to, brought to light. Like the idea that like doing something in a way that is to the best of your abilities, simply because that's like, you know, the, the altruistic thing to do, right. Is to like, Hey, sit down and do a great job. Even though this right. person is, you know, even though this person is maybe, maybe they don't even have that much of a concern. They're just kind of doing something recreationally or for fun or they're a hobbyist. Um, you know, they're just, they're just there enjoying it. But if you sit down and take the time and you can enjoy the process of like discovering and trying and testing and, you know, tweaking, that's a lot of fun. And so like largely like having those tools makes that a much more enjoyable process. I think, I think it's going to be the kind of thing where, you know, it's like making coaches enthusiastic about their job. I think there's a, just like an epidemic of coaches that are just fucking exhausted and bored and like, you know, it's like like you've got 260 athletes like and and like you really care about every one of them like it's like we know that's not true right um if you're a person in that place where it's like you're just grinding through it for for the money or for the clout or whatever it is it's not a it's not the kind of thing where you're in a place where you are sitting down and thoughtfully crafting and creating something that really does well for the individual uh, but also is like rewarding to you as a coach so I think it's cool that like you, you sound, you texted me the other day. It's like, you sound renewed is the wrong word. Cause it would imply that you weren't enthusiastic before, but it is like a, a resurgence of excitement around like, Oh, we just trained and competed. Well, I want to help your know, Danny do even better. Like, you know, what can I do? What do you think about this? Like, I'm going to try that. That to me is what makes coaching an enjoyable profession. Right. So that's cool to hear. I, I like that. I think, you know, that's the ultimate goal for a lot of what we're doing is trying to share that and try to bring a little bit more, you know, a little more excitement back to the like arena of coaching and, and not being something where it's like, you know, programming doesn't matter and cues yeah. and whatever, like techniques, like none of it really fucking matters. Just go in and do it. And like, you're not going to do well anyway. So who cares? 
Well, um, the thing is, like, the people who are saying that aren't coaching people who are top five in the nation or, like, the best in the nation. And it's like, what's, you know, what's going to get Danny from second to first? That's what I'm concerned about is, like, mm-hmm. okay, the total she just hit, that would have placed her second in the nation. And we are looking at first place, and it's like, that's not far off. Yeah. And it's like, what's the difference? It's like the difference is fucking dialing things in. The difference isn't yeah. training harder. Everybody trains hard. I don't, yeah. I can't, and you, I don't know what it means to train harder. I literally don't, right? Because it's like you do everything on the program, you train as hard as you need to. So it's a yeah. matter of programming to even elicit harder training. Um, more more this, shrugs. Yeah. That's well, harder training for you, bud. <laughs> Get them shrugs going. Yeah. So, that whole like train hard things, it's confusing because everybody does the program. Everybody does yeah. what they're given. So it's like, okay, make a program that can take advantage of training hard to yeah. yield better results. And, you know, with Danny, it's like, okay, we're at, we're at the Arnold. She's with, I mean, like the strongest people in the nation, uh, which is already really fun to watch. It's like all these people are dialed in. They're locked in. How can we do mm-hmm. a better job than them? You know, and I think a lot of that's like bringing out the competitive aspect of it or the competitive competitive nature of sport and saying, this person beat us by, you know, five dots or f- five Roby points. That fucking sucks. Yeah. I don't want to oh, yeah. lose. I know, like, that. that's frustrating. So it's like, we're going to beat that person. We're going to beat this other person on Instagram who we don't even compete against, who's in a different weight class. It's like, I just want to out total everybody. And a lot of that is like, okay, well, then how do we dial in the programming? How do we dial in the training so that we can hit national records and, and win nationals and, you know, take it as far as we can take it. And, and that to do that takes, I posted a, an article in the mentorship group and it talks about like, it's kind of breaking down elite level performance and it breaks down the factors that go into it. And it's like, it really is taking advantage of all those because as soon as you leave a stone unturned, you leave a stone unturned with the potential to have a big enough effect to make a difference. Yeah. It's like, so if you, if you don't master exercise variation, you don't master fatigue management, you don't master, you know, implementing some sort of like loading protocol or, or volume, um, uh, loading protocol over time, or, you know, you don't periodize training correctly. It's like, well, how many kilos are you leaving on the table that could take the next spot, right? Could climb you up the ranks to be the best weightlifter, powerlifter, athlete possible. Yeah. And you know, like, uh, uh, couldn't say it any better. I think the one thing you touched on that I would just add to, and I think I've talked about this before, is like, the, there's two mentalities, and you see this at every level in almost everything, from from like day-to-day life, to business, to coaching, to competing, is the two different mindsets. There's the, I don't want to lose mindset which is you go into a competition or you go into the process with the understanding that you just don't want to lose, right? So it doesn't even matter where you get to, you just don't want to lose. And the other side of that, the other type of mentality is like the I have to win. Mm. And the people who have to win see everything in front of them not as necessarily like an obstacle that's insurmountable, but as a, a something in the way to them vi- being victorious. So it becomes a, okay, it's a solution-driven approach, which is there's a, an issue with the programming. I need to fix this so that we can win. I need to find the right movements so we can win. I need to do this so that we can win. I have to win. I have to be victorious. The other approach is this kind of passive, you know, like, you know, oh, there's a big problem. Well, as long as I don't, you know, as long as I can do what I'm doing, I won't lose. Mm. I won't be last. I won't, you know, fail. I won't do whatever. And that, you know, ultimately that's always going to be a a worse situation in my opinion because you're going to get to a point where, you know, people will just keep pushing it down, right? You're going to get further and further down the list. You're going to get further and further away. You're going to lose more whatever. You're going to, your business is going to fall apart more because you're not in the, taking the approach that I have to win. Like I, everything in front of me is just clawing my way forward to the, to the victory. Um, so yeah, I mean, totally, uh, totally all, all on board what you just said. I think that's awesome. Well, and I think I remember we talked about when you and you and Joanne decided to move locations for the gym. And part of that was 
predicated on this idea of like, we're not going to lose in the space that we're in, but we're also not going to win. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, if you risk losing, you also can have the potential of winning. Yeah. And uh, I, just from my side of it and, and seeing how things have played out, it seems like kind of moving locations, expanding the gym, developing the business a bit more. It's, it seems like it's done well, or it's, it's yeah. doing a lot better. Yeah. Um, has opened up a lot of like opportunities and um, experiences. And it seems like kind of taking that, you know, taking that risk, um, you know, works out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, and, and not every risk does, right? People definitely right. F fail. People definitely have issues, but it's like, do you want to live, do you want to live or behave or coach in a way where it's like, you're just, you know, that was good enough. Like, that's fine. Yeah. You know, I just want to hold on to this and not, you know, not be, the worst coach there, right? Or whatever it is, you just, I don't want to lose a client. So I'm just going to do this and this, like, instead of, Hey, I'm going to like really try to be better at what I am. Yeah. You know, I want to do good work. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is like your commitment to the process, your commitment. It, it's like the process is, is not like, well, I'm going to coach well. It's like, I need to understand coaching as well as I can. I, I need to understand everything that goes into it. Um, and then be able to execute on it. Cause like yeah. knowing it and doing it are two separate things, yeah. doing it and not knowing it is like also two separate things. Um, cause you can be a great coach and not know why. Yeah. People can yeah, ask you, it's like, hey, you know, what about your programs? Great. And it's like, you know, we just try our best and we, 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 you know, really committed to the process and that's what sets us apart. And it's like, or you just have a really good grasp on what the person needs, <laughs> you, can, yeah. you know, um, or you, you have a way of, communicating to people that inspires them and gets them to kind of, um, reach their own potential. Right. So, so that you can, you can do things well and not know you can do things well and know, and we're all for doing things well and knowing why it worked and why it's working and how we can communicate to other people so that they can do the same thing. Yeah. I, I couldn't say it better. Uh, that's a great show. That was really cool. I think it's a great topic. Uh, hopefully you guys learned some stuff. Hopefully it was, interesting entertaining uh hopefully you didn't you know have a hard time looking at josh on screen but you know i can't help with that uh josh where can people find you if they're interested in uh you refining their program taking them to meets have them kick ass and be the best lifter they can be yeah i would go to uh teammate.com fill out the contact form just mention my name uh, or you can go to Instagram, go to Josh underscore Phil WL, and you can shoot me a message. Um, that's how some people get in contact with me. And then we just start a conversation and, uh, kind of push toward, you know, working together and, and figuring out what makes sense. So I would do those two things and, uh, yeah, let's help you become a better weightlifter, powerlifter or athlete. Yeah. If you're interested in remote coaching with myself, uh, you know, check out teammate.com. Uh, you can go find me on Instagram. You can DM me. Uh, more so, though, if you're interested in, if you're a coach, you're interested in uh, maybe taking part of the beta test for our coaching platform, Coach Logic, uh, shoot me an email. I'll be collecting names now. Uh, we'll be pushing this out probably, you know, hopefully by the end of March, maybe a little bit into April. But uh, super excited. You know, um, I don't know if I've showed Josh the new mock-ups but it looks awesome really really excited for this um yeah and then obviously our title sponsor i think lifting.ai if you're interested in a completely flexible customizable individualized program in an app form uh check out the best weightlifting app there is we've had people compete at very high levels with this hunter uh hunter hayes huntington hayes uh sixth place at nationals uh, yeah. pretty solid. Uh, he totals around 310 kilos at 96. Uh, Matt, uh, I want to say Matt Tung out of Hong Kong yeah. competed at the Asian championships. He's competing in Thailand, I think at the world cup as well. Uh, and then we had two or three lifters from Brunei all totaling in the 300 plus range, uh, between 89, 81, 89, 96 kilos, um, all kicking ass in, uh, Asians, and then I'm going to see them in Thailand. I'm going to coach one of them in Thailand. Um, so yeah, super cool. I, you know, if you want to be that guy, if you want to total 300, try the app out. Uh, and then if you do, we'll be talking about you on this podcast and we'll see you next time.